take that word? It is time to understand the harvest like never before. Last week I talked about wisdom in the harvest. Today I'm going to talk about understanding the harvest. And why we do need to understand the harvest is this, because with wisdom is great, but without understanding you can operate the wisdom. We need to understand the deep level of harvest and how to harvest. How many of us often say, well, we just need to claim Jesus, but we, we go out there and we kind of get stuck and we just say, God, I, I don't really know how to grab a hold of these people's hearts. How many ever get there? We get to that place and say, whoa, uh, I'm, I know I'm supposed to minister. I know I'm supposed to be evangelist. I'm, I know I'm supposed to bring people to Jesus, but I just feel like I'm stuck with it. Because sometimes we just don't know how to understand the harvest. We don't understand how to grab a hold of the deep level of what Jesus Christ wants us to do and how to do it. I think we focus on the wrong things. I think we live in the critical world instead of the blessed world. We need to switch over the criticalness to the blessed. We need to walk in the force of Christ Jesus like never before. We, we have to stop looking at saying how I would teach things differently or how I would say it differently. It's not wrong, but I would, I would just up it here a little bit, uh, put it down there a little bit. We've got to stop tweaking everything and tweak ourselves in the presence of God. And I'm going to share with Matthew 13, 44 to 52. This is, uh, continues from last Sunday this, in the same chapter as we spoke on last Sunday. But I'm going to bring it with a different twist, hopefully. And we're going to bring it forth in the presence of God. Now, I'm talking about the end times, and I, I realize this might not seem like it, but the fact is that before I'm going to speak about the rapture, I want us to get the people in. So I want to, the harvest is first before the rapture, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> we need to get the harvest in our mind. We need to get salvation in our mind. We need to get wholeness into our mind. We need to get a hold of the presence of God to gather the people together like never before. We need to really grab a hold of that because there's a consequence to the people that don't grab a hold of this. And there's a consequence to those people that we can't reach. Or the people that don't get the love of the body of Christ. Did you know a lot of people, almost probably a majority of people know Christ Jesus. They know they've been introduced to it. They've been pronounced about it. But why don't they stay with Christ Jesus? Why? It's because they don't have the body. But you by yourself in Christ Jesus are, is not the fulfillment of Christ Jesus. Most people that are born again and that don't stick with the church system, if you want to call it that, the church that God has designed us to be, because the Bible says, against the church, gates of hell cannot prevail. We have to understand that these people get lost because we are judgmental sometimes, or we are critical sometimes, or we choose not to love them sometimes, or we choose not to pull them in sometimes. And we become a critical-minded church, and I'm not saying, I'm, I'm sure you guys are all perfect here, but I'm talking just in general here. And when we lock, walk in this presence of the Holy Ghost, and we look at this place and say, God, why are they not staying with the kingdom? Or why did they just go through the motions and not accept it? Then I have to look at myself, am I doing my part? When I call these people in and I, I pray for these people, am I doing what God has called me to do? Because our, as a body, it has something to do with the people come in. Everything we do has brings value out of people and what our, our culture, our religiosity, or our culture of our human nature does is we bring the criticalness out of people instead of the value out of people. Would you not agree? Do I get amens or yeses in? Isn't it true? How many people ever experience, even yourself saying you have to choose not to look at the criticalness of a person? I have to work hard with that, don't you? I have to choose to see the value in the heart of somebody beyond their circumstances because I don't understand their circumstances all the time. We don't even know where they come from. And that very thing they come from could bring them to the circumstances they're at and they don't even want to be there. And here we're looking at the circumstance when we need to look at the value to take them out of the circumstance. We have a goal. We have a treasure point within each human nature and each human being. God has designed you for something. And we need to grab a hold of that harvest because if you don't understand value, you won't bring people in. If you're going to try to change people's critical mind and their statements of faith and everything else, they won't come. But they will come when you bring value in Christ Jesus to them. When they see the love of Jesus and you see the presence of God and say, look, I see that God has created you for that. All of a sudden there's value. We can't change people by trying to change their critical minds. We can only change them by bringing value to the heart of the people. I was going to read, wasn't I? Matthew, we'll go as far as we go. We'll go as far as we go. We've got some good teachers back there. They can last long today, I think. Um, no, we'll be. Matthew 13, 44. And it's hot in here, so just, just pretend that it's the Holy Ghost anointing, okay? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Just, just take the Holy Ghost anointing in the heat. <laughs> 
A kingdom of heaven. Uh, Jesus gave us about four, in this passage, he'll give us about four incidents of what a kingdom of heaven looks like. So for harvest, we have to understand what the ki kingdom of heaven looks like first and see what we're harvesting, right? I, sometimes I don't think we understand the kingdom of heaven completely because we don't know what we're harvesting for. It's like going to a wheat field and trying to harvest uh, rye or something. It's just not going to work. We have to understand the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven so we know what we're harvesting for. So we have to get the idea of harvest in our head and understand it more deeper than ever, than we ever have in this time and age. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hid in a field, the, which a man has found, he hides, and for joy, therefore, goes and sells all he has and buys the field. You know what? <laughs> Jesus is like that. Jesus is giving the example of the kingdom of heaven. He says he's looking for these treasures, and you all are treasures. You all have value. There's treasure in each one of you. There's treasure in you. And he's looking for this treasure, and he finds one treasure, and he's going to buy the whole field just so that he can have you. He's going to walk in this place, and, and this is harvest. This is the way we need to look at the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> I'm going to do whatever it takes to get your soul in here. Everybody around you and everything else, I'm going to love them too. But I am, I'm doing it because I love that treasure that's there. Jesus said, that's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. He's looking for this treasure, and he found you, and he's going to buy the whole world, and he's going to die for the whole world just because of you and me. He died, and he shed his blood just so that he could grab a hold of your treasure. He is the loving God. That's what the kingdom of heaven is. What does treasure mean? A place which is good and precious. It's collected and laid up. God has I believe he has, the day you're born, you are called. He has laid up something in you, a part of his treasure, and he's waiting it to be revealed and come out of the hidden field. Each one of us. He's laid up the treasures. He's been there. It's in like in a casket. So we're in a vessel, and God's laid up a treasure in this vessel, this vessel, that vessel, every vessel here. God's laid up this treasure. And it's time to grab a hold of the value and for us to grab a hold of the value of who Jesus is and to grab a hold of the value who you are and what God has created you to be. If I don't grab a hold of the value and if I'm just grabbing a hold of your circumstances, there's nothing there. It's hard to love circumstances. You can only love a human nature and only a human being that God has created. That's what you can love. You can't, you, it's hard to love problems. It's hard to overcome it, and you can never ever connect as husband and wife, as family, as church, if you are looking at the problem, because you can't love problems. You can only love people. So we have to grab a hold of that treasure, each one of us, and when I'm as a pastor, I need to look at the treasure of you, and go into that treasure, and if that person has a, uh, I know they have a choice of denying it, I, that's up to them, but at least I can grab a hold of the treasure. That value that you have is my honor to you. Not my respect necessarily, because you have to gain that, but my honor to you. That deep level of honor that I choose to honor each human nature for who the God has created them to be. And I choose to grab a hold of that value, because I know if I can grab a hold of that value, if I can help you see your value, I know you will fight for that value. Because what happens when you see treasure? When you dig and all of a sudden you see this gold, and you know it's going to make you rich. You're going to dig for it all, and you won't stop till you dig and see it all. That's what treasure does to us. And God has that value, and if we can grab a hold of that value, you can grab it, and you're going to start digging, and you're going to get all rid of all the garbage that's going to fly out of the way. Praise God. But as a harvest, to understand a harvest, the only way you can harvest is to find value in people. Don't try to change your sinful nature. That will change when you find value. They will want to change it, and you will be able to be there to help them change it. We often grab in the hold of this, and we go in this place, and I see it often, where people are trying to change the circumstances of people, which, which we will yet, don't worry. But the fact is, if you can just grab the value first so that you can help them deal with their circumstances. Because when they have value, they're willing to fight to get out of it. Amen? So we are going to go in the field and Jesus buys the whole field. He says, I'm going to do it all for them because I choose. I know there's going to be enough treasure in there that it's worth buying. Now listen to this. And Matthew, um, he says... He will goes out and sells, and he will find that treasure. And Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Seek, and you shall find that treasure within you. Seek. You will find it. Knock, and it shall be open to you. Once you find the treasure, open the door. It's there. Use that value. Just don't stop seeking that value that is within each other. 
Seek it. Look for it. Because that is the harvest. Verse 45 says again, the, no, the, the second thing that he says about the kingdom of, of, of heaven is, the kingdom of heaven is like to a merchant, which means a tradesman, seeking go, uh, goodly pearls. <laughs> Good pearls. He's looking for it. What does goodly pearls mean this? When the kingdom of heaven is like a man that is looking for something precious. Now when I go look, my wife is not here, if I would look for my wife and I, I look for this preciousness in her, I look for the good pearl. Because when I get that, everything else just kind of disappears because love hits in. No, son, I don't see no problems no more. I don't see no character flaws. I don't see nothing no more because I just see love. When we do that with each other, not necessarily as you would do it to a wife, but when you go into a place of seeing the good in them, all of a sudden everything else disappears and we see for what God has created them to be and we can actually nurture the heart of somebody and love on the heart that God has designed them to be. Now we're truly harvesting the presence of God and the people because we're seeing value in the people that we're bringing in. Doesn't mean they have to change the course. But without value, they don't want to change. They don't feel like changing. They feel like dying without value. Whereas then it says, the kingdom is like a merchant, a tradesman that has goodly. This is the second thing. This goodly is a beautiful. He's looking for the handsome, excellent, the, the supreme, the preciousness in a person. He looks for that pearl. The pearl means this. He looks for that perfect word of great value. That's what pearl means here. It means, uh, pearl means like in the spiritual sense, it would mean a good word of great value. Mean that I have created you with great value. That's the second part. And this uh, next part is 46. It says, uh, sorry, this is still the same part of that. Who then, we have found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had to buy it. And Jesus himself <laughs> gave up his only son, everything he had, his son, and for this great price. Like, really think about this. This, he's given this an example of the kingdom of heaven, and he's given an example of his kingdom, how it looks. And he says, I gave up and went and sold all I had. I gave up my own son, Jesus Christ. And then I bought that pearl, and I bought back everything. Every one of you has been bought back now with great value. Every one of you, every one of you <coughs> that choose to follow Jesus Christ, even if you don't, you're still bought. You have that choice now of great value. Like he's done it. Praise God that he's bought, us, bought it out from the enemy. Praise God that covenant has been made. Praise God that he saw that pearl within us, that great value within us. We have it now. We have the ability to harvest and do what Jesus did. And it was to bring the greatness out of people so they would come to him and operate in the greatness that they're designed to operate in. Verse uh, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a, to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered up every kind. Yes, every kind. So if you think you're different, you're the one that's gathered. If you think there's something wrong with you, you're gathered. Every kind was gathered. Yeah, if you think you're the wrong color or the, you have a sore back or you have anything and God doesn't care. No, he gathered every kind. Every single kind. God's kingdom net does not leave any kind out. Every human nature, every one that's created is created for him, him alone. Then it says, this, uh, this place it was this. It's the kingdom of heaven. It was like a net. Which, which uh, 48, which when it was full, they threw it on the shore, and they cast, they sat and down, and they gathered the, uh, the good into the vessel and cast out the bad away. So when we harvest, you have to understand the bad will come in. And God himself will divide those things. We will find a place where we grab a hold of the good, now, we can take this either as human nature or we can take it as our individual. He will grab this thing. It's like getting a fish and he's going to grab a good value and he's going to take all the bad and cast it away out of us. <laughs> Just kind of cast it out. Cast it out. So when we grab a hold of these nets, guess what's going to happen? When we grab a hold of people, there's going to be a lot of things to deal with. There's a lot of bad stuff to get out of the shore. All the guts and stuff has to be taken out. Everything, you know, it's just, you have to understand that when we gather these people together, you can expect it to be perfect. You're going to you're gonna have to expect some chaos, just so you know. Last week I talked about how the wheat and tear grew up together and they couldn't take the tear out until the wheat was totally harvested. So that means within church we have people right to the very end or very end to stay in there until the harvest time and then they finally find that freedom. Or the people leave that are the tares, one of the two. 
or they finally find freedom. They finally find, wow, the miracle working God. And it is a time of harvest this year. And it is a time to the terrors to get out of your life. It is a time to remove that this year. It means that the harvest is complete. It means we can, we can safely remove your issues of your life. You, your suffering can be over this year if you choose to be part of this harvest. Your suffering can be over this year because I believe spiritually, not just myself as a prophet, but many prophets have said this is the years of the great harvest. Meaning this, is that we're done with the enemy. Now we're just going to battle him and win him. But we're done with him taking over us with fear. We're done with him if you choose to walk in this harvest. We're done with it. I am. I choose to be done with it. I'm choosing to go all the way and I'm choosing to do the vision that God has called me to be in. Or well, some, for some of you, the vision that you're called to be under. And walk in the fullness of it and know the kingdom of God. Is dividing the things. Yes, even sometimes he takes the people that need to be taken out of your life to. People that don't want to change. People that don't want to. Oh, I could do a lot more on that. But anyway, let's go verse 49. And so, it's, so it shall be like this at the end of the world. So now we looked at today's world, but let's look at the end of the world too. And I've been trying to do that with these last couple of messages. been looking in comparison and walking in together. And this is the way it should be in the end of the world. Right now we don't have to worry about this part yet. But let's do that rest before we have to worry about this part. Because at the end of the world, this is what's going to happen. This is Jesus Christ himself saying this will happen at the end of the world when he comes down as a thunder and lightning comes in. In seconds he'll be here and he will lift up his people. This is what's going to happen. I can't change the fact, but this is what's going to happen. So shall it be on the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just. He shall sever the wicked from the just. That's just going to happen. But I'd rather get, deal with all the wicked now and deal with the place and bring people to Jesus so that we have more just. We need more just people. We need more people willing to walk all the way with Christ Jesus. Wouldn't you agree? And then he says, Go forth and, and the, the angels shall consever the wicked and the just and shall cast them into the fire, furnace fire. There shall be wailing of gnashing of teeth. That's Jesus talking here. He's giving you an example. He's saying, Guys, I'm telling you, I'm teaching you, I'm giving you straight forth messages, I'm telling you how to do this. I just want you to stick with this, follow Jesus, get people saved, bring people to Jesus, just live for me and you, people will come to you. Just live this life. It's not that hard. Because at the end day, he will sever the wicked from the just. Those are just facts, right? How many agree on facts? Okay, those are facts. So let's choose to follow Jesus. Say, well, I have all this trouble. I don't know. It's not about your trouble. It's about your heart. It's about you grabbing hold of Jesus and following him all with all your might and with all your soul and with your, all your mind. It's not about you making mistakes. Those things will happen, and those things I guarantee you will happen daily probably. But the fact is, it's your heart. When you follow Jesus Christ and you choose to bring the value out, the rest is not going to be there as much. You're going to win your battles this way. Now the circumstances are not your life. Now they're your battles. The circumstances need to be your battle so you can be victorious and be victorious over them. We need to understand the harvest. The biggest thing to understand is to grab the value out of somebody because if we don't grab the value out of somebody, there's no use trying to bring them to the kingdom because they, don't even, they think they're condemned when there's no value. They think they're being, being condemned or whatever, just saying that they're no good. And they feel guilty about every little thing. So they, they often get saved out of fear. Now, sometimes that works. I mean, that's praise God for those people that can do that. Now, I would love to do it more often that way, but I find it doesn't work for me. But the fact is that when I love on people, it seems to work for me. When I bring the value out of the heart of every soul and say, and show them how alive Jesus is, it works for me. When I go to somebody that's never spoken to me before, and God speaks something to me in my heart, to their heart, that nobody else knows but God, that's the value that is bringing forth. Now, the Holy Spirit works. Now, the presence of God works in a marvelous way. Now, I don't have to try to persuade them how evil they are. Now you just have to persuade them that there's good in you. And when the good is in you, we need to get rid of the evil. Because evil does not go in the kingdom of God. But when we grab a hold of the great value of who people are in Christ Jesus. Amen? So, but it says, he will cast it in the furnace of fire. These wicked things will get thrown away. But let's look at that today even. Allow God to remove the wicked and throw it in fire. Let that stuff burn away from your life. All the wicked stuff that you feel that is bothering you, your circumstances. Let's start letting it burn away. 
Let's start taking it away from our life. Let's start taking it away from the very essence of who we are and allow God to become the fullness in us. Let's, let's bring the just. The wicked will be removed from our life and the just will come alive in our life. How many of you want that? I want the just to be alive in me. I want Jesus Christ to be alive in me. I want that wicked stuff to get off of me and not the fear of the enemy not to be there no more. And I don't want to control because when there's fear, you respect the fear so much that you start doing evil because you're fearful. We've got to walk in the presence of God and walk in the fear of God so that we can choose to walk in His presence and then our life is full of joy. The Bible says that we become living sacrifices. It doesn't say we are dead sacrifices. We are living sacrifices of God. It means that li- the word living means to be full of joy, enjoying life. Why are we living sacrifice? Because we chose to get rid of the dead stuff. Get rid of the wicked stuff. We, we removed it. And now we have true harvest happening in our hearts, but also in the people around us. You know what? We need to harvest ourselves. Did you know that? We need to harvest the things that we sowed. How many of you have sold things in your life? Sold for healing, sold for finances, sold for something, right? We need to harvest. And when we choose to remove the wicked, because it's harvest time, and now we will see the harvest. We will see the riches of everything that there is. And then Jesus said, have you understood these things? Have you understood these things? Do you get it? And I say, okay, God, are you asking me this? <laughs> okay, I want to get this. I really want to get the idea of harvest. And I believe very strongly is that when we touch the heart of people, when we touch the value of people, and I choose not to be a critic against any ministry or any person, if I choose just to bring the truth out, I believe that will be more powerful than trying to prove somebody wrong. Amen? And that's what this great value, this is what the harvest looks like. The harvest looks like by bringing the truth out. We are called to do what Jesus did. We're not called to do what anything else is said to do. And Jesus, yes, he, when, when they came to their face, he rebuked the enemy. Absolutely. But he never, ever did it without compassion and love. He brought forth the word of God. And he had so much passion that in the middle of his trips, he said, oh, man, okay, I'll heal you. You know, he, he comes to that point where he, that wasn't his purpose of the trip, but there was somebody sick, he had compassion, and he still healed them. That's the kind of God we serve. And that's the kind of harvest we need to do because what did that do? It brought multitudes, people, to follow him yet more. So sometimes we walk on our path, I don't have time for you, I don't have time for you, I don't have time for you. And sometimes that person just nags you or nags you, you just say, okay, in the name of Jesus, be healed. <laughs> Let's bring some healing here. And all of a sudden it gets healed and all of a sudden you find more people bugging you. <laughs> now, now we have to understand that when we walk and follow Jesus and we walk as a church, because Jesus didn't walk alone, did you notice? He had his disciples doing all kinds of work. Everybody around him. He never walked alone. And he didn't do it all alone. Even while they were there, Jesus gave them the authority to do many things. Anyway, let's go on. In verse 52, Therefore, not therefore, Then said he to them, Therefore, every strive which is instructed to, do, to the kingdom of heaven is like a man that is a householder, which brings forth out his treasures things new and old. Now we become a treasure. We become the householder of his temple of the Holy Spirit that we are. And we bring forth the new and old. What do we do? Why do we do it? Just like the fish on the net. We bring it out on the shore. We would take away the old and we, we knew the new. And we, or the old that is good, we keep it, but we separate the facts. And we bring it out and say, here we go. The old and the new, because we are the householder of Christ Jesus. How many of you believe that? We're the, we have the vessel of the Holy Spirit. So we need to bring forth, and we have to separate the stuff that is old and that is no good. It's worn out and used. That's what the old means. It doesn't even mean it's evil. It doesn't even mean it's a sin. It just means it's not working for you no more. It's worn out. Remove it. Get the new going that works for you. The new culture, the new, new presence of God, the new thing God has for you today. Don't try to do something that you did 10 years ago and it's just a repeating a religiosity, but do something new that becomes alive and well from Him. So we need to put it on our shore. We need to put all the stuff there and say, okay, this is not working no more. <laughs> Putting that away. That's why I changed so much. This ministry is always on change mode. If it doesn't work, we just add more to it or minus some things. We just keep going in the presence of God. Okay. So now I just want a couple of scriptures to sh- uh, tell you that God doesn't want you to be in the wrath, okay? God doesn't want you to be in the wrath. So don't be worried about the fire. Um, and if you are worried, get saved right now and come running up right now and be saved. And what does saved mean? People say, well, that's just saying a prayer. Well, being born again, it's in Romans, I forgot what chapter, but it's about receiving the adoption of Christ Jesus. 
Being a born again is like taking the, bringing a child into your life and you go to the hospital and it's born and it's, it gets registered to your name and it's yours and full-fledged your kid. So when you get born again, you get this a document in Christ Jesus and this uh, supernatural ability that it almost sounds it's like when you say, Jesus, I choose to be a part of your family. It's like, okay, you finish your adoption. Praise God, you are totally part of the family. You totally get the inheritance. From there on, you live in the life of Jesus. So born again is not religious. Born again is, is, is like an adoption. That's what Romans talks about. We need to be adopted into Christ Jesus so that we can live in his benefit and his inheritance. We have to make that choice to be part of the family. That's all being born again is. It's saying, Jesus, I, I, I'm choosing to be, letting you be the Lord and the Savior of my life, and I, I am choosing to be part of this family. And, and there he goes. And Jesus says, you are. Then from there on, you have a lot of responsibility. <laughs> but you have a lot of responsibility for that too. You know, either way, you have responsibility. So... Either way, you move forward. It's just going to be a little easier when you walk fully in Christ Jesus. Anyway, for Thessalonians um, 1, 9 to 10, it says, For they didn't so show of us what manner of entering in we had to you. This is a really strange way of saying it. But anyway, and, they turn, and how you turn to God from the idols and serve the living true God. Now, I'm going to try to read it a little smoother. For they didn't so show of us what manner of entering into we had to, to you. He says, and how you turn to God from idols. You turn to God and away from idols. And to serve the living, true God. Okay? And then verse 10 says this, and to wait for the Son, which is Jesus Christ, from heaven, whom he has raised from the dead, even Jesus, even deliver us from all the wrath to come. I mean, it says, from the wrath to come. I, I, I put the word all in there. Sorry. But the wrath to come. Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. How many believe and know that you serve the true living God? The wrath is going to be delivered from you. You want more proof? Okay. I thought you would want some. <laughs> Romans 5, 8, 9. But God condemns God commends, sorry, not condemns, commends <laughs> his love toward us. And that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us when we were not perfect. Man, what a God of hope, hey? We were sinning away there, and he says, I'm going to die for men anyway because I believe they're going to turn around and follow me. Pretty cool, eh? We have a really cool, awesome Jesus Christ. <laughs> He's the one to serve, I'm telling you. And verse 9 says this, much more than, much more than being now justified by His blood, Jesus Christ, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Promises of God that we don't have to live in wrath. Promise of God that when the great tribulation comes, I strongly believe we don't have to live in. Now, the Bible talks about two tribulations, which I hope to get in next week. <laughs> you know how it is. You just have to follow the Holy Spirit. Uh, so I don't always get where I want to get every week, but when we walk in the place of knowing that he doesn't want us to live in wrath, because the Bible says in the Great Tribulation that he removes the Spirit of God from the earth. And without the Spirit of God, you're going to be in wrath. So when the Holy Spirit removes you, removes himself, I believe we will be removed with it. Because he promises us to save us from the wrath. He promises it. More than one place, and we'll prove more of that as we go along. First uh, Corinthians... Um, 51 to 52. Oh, I don't even know what chapter that is. Sorry. I'll get it for you. Not, I don't have it on my... <laughs> First Corinthians. Uh, what would it be? God, show me. Maybe... Well, can't think of it right now. Either way, it's in First Corinthians, and there's verse 51 and 52. <laughs> for some reason, I didn't put the chapter there. I do apologize. I'll try to find it for next week for you. Verse 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep and be dead. We should not all sleep. It means we shall not all be dead. But we shall all be changed. I love this. We shall all be changed at this day. It says to change it means to exchange one thing for another to be transformed. We're not going to be dying. We're not going to all be dead. But we're going to all transform. We're going to all change. And we're not talking about transformers. But we're talking about being transformed to God into a whole different body. That is, is acceptable. Hmm? Chapter 15, there you go. We got something that was working. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 52. Thank you. 
So being changed is this. He says, not all shall sleep, but we shall all be changed. There's a mystery that we shall show. We shall all be changed. Verse 52 says this. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the, the, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall rise incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. God is coming in that place. And I'm going to leave it with that. It's just to share with you that God doesn't want you to be in wrath. God is a loving God. And when you study the Bible, you don't find that God wants you to suffer these things. You have to understand that if we have a loving God and we follow him, he takes care of us no matter where we're at. He's going to take care of us. And some people say argue about pre-tribulation, um, mid-trib and pro. You can argue the point all you want. Either way, you're going to go to heaven, okay? And so if you want to argue, then argue. Uh, but the fact is that if God's going to take me out of wrath, well, then I, I expect that. I expect him to hold on his promises and not have me in wrath. So if he's going to have me through the tribulation, which I don't think, but if he's going to have, I'm going to walk around with a bubble around me and not be in wrath. Something's going to happen. <laughs> but I'm going to, I, I'll try to prove it differently. But that's, you know, the arguments that we have are not worth arguing about. But the fact is, let's take the word of God for what it is and really bring it forth and say, God is going to save me from wrath. Because we are choosing to walk in this harvest today. And why are we harvesting people? Why do you think we are growing a church? It's because we don't want people to go to hell and we don't want them to be in wrath. Right. Why do you think that there's a great harvest? Why do you think there would be a great harvest now before a tribulation? Why do we think that harvest would happen now? Why? Because God is getting his people ready to not be able to be in the wrath. God is moving forward in an amazing way. And I'm going to talk about that next week more, I hope. But at the same time, let's close it off. And I think I did fair with time. Uh, I could go on with my next message, but I, I, I will do it this coming week sometime with some people in between. But the fact is, let's live off of the fear of the enemy. And let's really expect the miracle of God today. Let's really, all these reports that we have, the report of the Lord is more important than the report of any man or any enemy. The report of the Lord is written for us. And in first, uh, second, uh, second Timothy 3, 16, it says, All word is breathed for proof and reproof. It is there to bring life to you. Every part of this. So it's written already. It's reproven for us already. Our life is proof to us already that God is all, all for, for it. I'm just going to make sure I got the scripture right because I hate getting scriptures wrong. Yes. Is it first Timothy or second Timothy? First Timothy, what did I say? Yeah, so it's Second Timothy three sixteen. Second Timothy three sixteen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable and for doctrine, for reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. So when we look at it and we, we, we wonder, okay, is this really of God? Is this really a thing? Yes it is. God has called us to be free and not to be fear of the enemy. He's called us to live in the fullness of his health and everything he's called us. In health, in your finances, and everything you are called to live in, you need to be in health. So what does health mean? I think we have to get our thinking right sometimes with that. What does, what does prosperity mean? You know, what does it really mean to you? Well, if you, are, if you are doing the work of God and you're blessing your kids and your kids are growing up well and, and, and you're making it, that's prosperity. When your kids get schooling, when your kids get this, when you, when you get that, and, and, and everybody gets blessed, you have prosperity. We have to understand that God wants to always to increase us, but we have to be thankful for the prosperity we're at. Because if we're never thankful for what God is doing today, we're not going to be thankful for what's going to happen tomorrow. You have to understand that I feel that I'm prosperous, and, and I think I could always use more money. What about you? I'm, I'm eating every day. I'm coming to church and I, I, I'm paying my bills so far and everything's happening, right? Look at our prosperity. We have to look at it today and say, what's going to be for tomorrow? If I'm thankful for today, tomorrow's going to be better. So prosperity is more of your soul and your mind. It's when you do the work of God, that's where you're supposed to prosper in. When you follow Him, that's where your prosperity relies in. Your, your prosperity that you get is to fulfill the call you have for God. Amen?